Thank you for listening to Emmanuel Baptist Church's podcast. For more information about the church, please visit our website at www.emmanuelmanning.com. Thanks and enjoy the sermon. First Timothy 1, 8 through 11. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So the question you might be asking is, is Drew going to deal with the law? Is he going to deal with the lawless and the disobedient? Is Drew going to talk about the unholy and profane People who strike their fathers and mothers? Is he going to talk about murderers or maybe the sexually immoral? No, I just want us to look at one phrase in verse 11. In accordance with the gospel, that is the good tidings, the good news, there's something that is good news worth proclaiming. What is the good news? It's the good news of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. And it's that phrase, blessed God that I want to look at tonight, because you'll remember back to our series in the Sermon on the Mount, it began with these phrases called the Beatitudes. The first word in the Sermon on the Mount is what word? Blessed. And when we defined that, we said that's that Greek word makarios, which could be translated happy or flourishing or living the good life, right? And so Jesus said, who lives the good life? It's those who are poor in spirit. Now, what I just want to do tonight is point out that in this verse, God is called what? Blessed, which means what? Happy, flourishing, living the good life. Tonight, I want to just answer one question, and it's this question. Why is God so happy? Why is God so happy? It's easy for us to understand why God might be angry. And God certainly is, in some senses, when he looks in some directions, angry. But you've all known people who can occasionally be angry. But when you look at the core of their being, they're happy. And so the question I want to ask, y'all are interested in this question? The question I want to ask tonight is, why is God so happy? John Piper says this in his book, Desiring God. Can you imagine what it would be like if the God who ruled the world were not happy? What if God were given to grumbling and pouting and depression like some jack in the beanstalk giant in the sky? What if God were frustrated and despondent and gloomy and dismal and discontented and dejected? Could we really join with David and say, oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you? My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I don't think so. We would all relate to God like little children who have a frustrated, gloomy, dismal, discontented father. They can enjoy him. They can only try not to bother him or maybe try to work for him to earn some little favor. Now, the problem, of course, is that is exactly how some of us view God. And that is exactly how some of us relate to him because we think he is grumpy dad. But the Bible has a different message, and the different message that the Bible has is that God is happy, and because he's happy, great men like David would say something like, my flesh faints for you, my soul thirsts for you. That our flesh should faint for God and our souls should thirst for him, because to be with God is to be with someone who is happy. And so tonight... If you're the kind of person who relates to God as if he is that distant uh, and dejected and gloomy and pouty dad, discontented father, I hope through the teaching of the Bible to change your mind. The Bible talks a lot about the Lord being happy. Psalm 104.31 says that God rejoices in his works. 
He rejoices in his works. Isaiah 62, 4 refers to the delight that God has in his people. Zephaniah 3.17, maybe many of you know this, says that Yahweh rejoices with gladness and exults with loud singing over his people. Galatians 5.22, the second fruit of the Spirit listed is what? That means if the Spirit is within you, the second fruit thereof is just wouldn't happen if the Spirit was one of the triune discontents. Right? And 1 Timothy 1.11 talks about the good news of the glory of the happy God. Jesus says in Matthew 25.21 to those who um, are sheep instead of goats, he says to enter into the what of your master? Enter into the joy of your master. In other words, heaven is a happy place. Heaven's a happy place. And God is overwhelmingly a happy God. David says this in Psalm 1611. And I'm not just going to list verses. I'm going to give reasons here for a second. But I just want you to see that I'm not cherry picking verses. Psalm 1611, which is a famous passage. David says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And what we need to do. And it's, it's one thing to live in the truth of the gospel, right? It's another thing to live in the good of the gospel. And we need to be a church that is really good at both of those things. Not only living in the truth of the gospel, but living in the good of the gospel. You know what I mean when I say living in the good of the gospel? That means enjoying things like forgiveness and enjoying things like Romans 8:28 and meditating and working and habituating yourself to truths that I need to really let seep down in my soul that that God is good and works good right and that that needs to be the default interpretation of my life, and we can't do that if we think that God isn't happy. So let's look at some reasons tonight as to why God is happy. First, God is happy because of his eternal fellowship with the Son and the Spirit. Some theologians, when they talk about the Trinity, talk about the happy land of the Trinity. That is, God is happy because he has forever dwelt with the Spirit and the Son. God has forever been part of a happy family. Many of us don't come from a happy family, and that kind of sets the emotional direction of our lives, and we have to work really, really hard against that. Uh, and then there are other people who come from really good families, and they can kind of stand up when some of us crumble because they come from good families. I can't... I've talked to people... Who were berated by their parents my parents like loved me I never doubted my parents love and so I can't imagine the the stability and strength that I have in certain areas of my soul just because I never had to doubt whether or not my mom and dad loved me to come from a good family is to come from a place of stability and strength and joy so what do you imagine God is like when he is a family that is always happy and holy Whenever Jesus needed to go to his happy place, he had a happy place. Do you have a happy place? When Jesus needed to go to his happy place, he just needed to go to where his father was speaking to him and of him. At the transfiguration, it says Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. He was still speaking, it says in Matthew 17, when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. When Jesus was baptized, what did the Father say of him? This is my beloved Son. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Whenever God talked about the Son, what kind of things does God say? I like this guy. Right? I'm pleased with him. So when the Father speaks of the Son, he speaks in dulcet tones. That means sweet. 
John 3, 35, Jesus said this, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Jesus never had to doubt, man, God loves me. The Father loves me. Colossians 1, 13, he, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, that is the Son he loves. Colossians 2, 9, for in Jesus the whole fullness of deity is pleased to dwell. Isaiah 42, 1, the Father talking of the Messiah who is to come. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. The Father, when he talks about, I don't, I'm tired, that's why I'm weepy. The Father, when he talks about the Son, not only talks about how much he loves him, but also talks about how good the Son is. I love my son because a bruised reed he won't break and a smoldering candle he won't put out. The father just doesn't go, I love that guy. He has specific reasons. I love my son because of his character. I love him because of his goodness. I love him because of his willingness to lay his life down. And when Jesus speaks to the father, he speaks with love. Let's not leave the Holy Spirit out. In Acts 13, 52, it says the disciples were continually filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So why is God happy? God's happy because he comes from a good family. He comes from a good family. He's part of a community where there is no sin, uh, where there is no shame, where there is no miscommunication, where there is no questioning of character. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are full of love. And the crazy thing is, if you have eyes to see it, the whole Bible is basically about this one truth, that the God who was forever happy as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has decided to create a world and to make people that he can bring into that fellowship. The point of all of creation is that the Trinity was such a good party, God had to make people to invite to it. And yes, we sinned, and yes, uh, we've fallen away, and yet, but, but Jesus has come to save, and he's come to save because the party is still good and still worth coming to. Fundamentally, the motivation of creation was the Trinity deciding to share their joy. And that's a crazy thought if you approach the world in a different way. Which means if the land of the Trinity was the happy place for Jesus, then for Christians, that should be our happy place as well. So why is God happy? He comes from a good family. Secondly, God is happy because of his attributes. He's happy because of his attributes. God is happy because he's holy. How much different would your life be if there was no regret over stupid choices that you made? It would be a different world for me uh, because my experience has been often living in response to dumb choices, and not just dumb choices, sinful, rebellious choices that I've made. What would life be like for you if you had never made any? That's the happiness of holiness. It's the happiness of a, a clean conscience, right? And praise the Lord, we can have a cleansed conscience. But imagine if you had never, ever actually done anything wrong. How happy would you be? Not prideful, just genuinely happy. God's happy because of his attributes. He's happy because of his omnipotence. Let me ask you this question. If you were good and nobody could stop anything you wanted to do, would you be happy? Now, if I were just to say, if you could do anything you wanted, would you be happy? You might go, maybe not. Because there are a lot of people who kind of, because of wealth or power, are functionally that way in this world. And they can be miserable sots, right? 
But what if you were really good and you could do anything you wanted to do? Would you be happy? Well, God is really, really good and he can do anything he wants to do. That doesn't mean that his decisions and what he wants to do always please us. But that's just because we don't have the wisdom to see what he's doing yet. But God's choices always please him. Ultimately. Ultimately, right? Not, not immediately, but ultimately. I mean, imagine if I was making a mosaic, right? Little tile art. Some pieces are dark and black, right? And when I put it in, I go, oh, that's a black piece. It's sort of like a black jelly bean. Kind of worthless and tastes terrible. Easter is not only a yearly reminder of the resurrection, it is a yearly reminder that black jelly beans are awful. Now just let that be the truth that you, you rest in, all right? If you like black jelly beans, I question your character at a deep level. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that, okay? I'm joking. Um, so yes, there are black tiles that aren't good, but then you... Take a step back and the whole picture is beautiful. That's what I mean. It's not that every single thing that God does immediately pleases him. It's that he lives in the joy of knowing that everything that he does will ultimately please him. Right? So he's good. And he, Now, does that mean suffering for us? Sometimes. But we're not God. We can't see the end of today, much less the end of everything. And we trust him. I mean, goodness, the thing that is most beautiful in the universe is the thing that immediately made God the saddest. What is that? Crucifixion and mutilation and death and suffering of his own son, right? That's a black tile. God knows what it's like to suffer under his own hand. But ultimately, as he steps back, he's happy in what he's working so he's happy because he can do whatever he wants and he's good. Psalm 135 says this, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Not only is God good, not only is he all-powerful, he's actually also all-wise. So why is God happy? Because he's good, he can do whatever he wants, and he knows the very best way to do it. And here's the thing. If you don't trust in God's sovereignty, God's goodness, and God's wisdom, then you will have no hope when real suffering comes. You will have no hope. You've got to believe in his goodness. You've got to believe in his sovereignty. And you've got to believe in his wisdom. And God believes in all those things. And because of that, he's happy. God is happy because of his attributes. God is happy because of his works. God was happy at creation. What does it say in Psalm 19? The heavens do what? They declare the glory of God. How else does it go? The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pour forth speech. Night after night reveals knowledge. The Lord is happy at creation because creation uh, showers forth his glory. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. From the rising of the sun to the end of it, its circuit of the sun, there is nothing hidden from its heat. God delighted in his creation. God really liked that he made stuff, right? And we need to get on board with this. C.S. Lewis says this, and he gets it right. There's no use trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That's why he uses th material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. You may not like that statement, but I'm, I'm not too upset by it. We may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes it. He invented matter. He likes it. 
I know some muddle-headed Christians have talked as if Christianity thought that sex or the body or pleasure were bad in themselves, but they were wrong. Christianity is almost the only one of the great religions which thoroughly approves of the body, which believes that matter is good, that God himself once took on a human body, that some kind of body is going to be given us uh, even in heaven uh, and is going to be an essential part of our happiness, our beauty, our energy. God likes stuff. When he made stuff, he said, behold, it is good. It's good. This is good. God is also happy because of the work of the cross. What does Isaiah 53 say? Yet it pleased God to bruise him. It didn't please God to bruise him because it pleased God to bruise him. It pleased God to bruise him because of what bruising him would accomplish. This Messiah shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By knowledge of the righteous servant, many will be justified. God is happy because of his work. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2 says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. God is happy because of his works. God is happy because of his plan. Even when his plan seems really terrible. Have you ever read the book of Lamentations? Listen to this verse. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. But when he looked to God, he was able to say, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Right? Day after day, new mercies I see. In his plan, there is no suffering that is meaningless, because in everybody's Intent to harm us, God has a counter intention, right? Genesis 50, 20, Joseph was able to forgive and love his brothers because he says, what you intended for evil, God what? Intended for good. And all the suffering and evil that's done against us, people may intend to do us harm, and God is so wise that he has a counter intention, even the things that we could not possibly understand. Andrew Wilson says this, The fact is, in every decision the Lord has made, there is a deep and lasting happiness that outlives all other feelings. Certain of the goodness of his purposes and permanently delighted by the glories of his cause, his creation, and his character, God is and can be nothing ultimately but happy. So God is happy because of his plan. Here's one you might not believe but here it is God is happy because of us Proverbs 15 8 the Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked but the prayer of the upright pleases him God is happy because of you 1 Samuel 15 22 Samuel replied does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So Samuel says to Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings? No. What does the Lord delight in? When you obey. So when you obey God, what does God do? He takes delight. Well, Drew, we're not saved by works. I know. I know that. But that doesn't render our obedience meaningless. God takes pleasure in Jesus' death on our behalf and his work on our behalf. And then having been saved, God really delights when you obey. He delights when you obey. When you have a choice between doing the thing that you know is sinful, when you in faith in him do the thing that is right, God is genuinely Delighted. Paul says this in Colossians, that we make it our aim to please the Lord. Why would Paul make it his aim to please the Lord if there's no shot of us pleasing the Lord? When you obey and do the right thing and do the righteous thing because you fear God and because you trust him, God is genuinely made happy by that. Not only is God happy when we obey or when we pray, 
the Lord is actually just happy to do good things for us. Jeremiah 32, 41 says this, talking about the new covenant. I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my soul. When God gives, he doesn't give in a double-minded way. Every single bit of him gives when he gives to you because he delights to give to you. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's interesting. We have to spend so much time in the South convincing people that they're lost before we can sort of present the gospel, right? And so preaching in the South is an interesting venture. And I fear sometimes that if I focus so much on preaching to hard hearts, which none of you have, you're here on a Wednesday night and you're in the heat, bless you, right? Um, that we may get the idea that the Lord puts faith out there as a test that we must pass. And maybe he's a little disappointed when people actually squeeze in. But that's not true, is it? It's, Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So God is actually happy because of us. How do we apply this? Well, number one, it's important that you believe that God is happy. Matthew 25, um, this is the, the parable of the, uh, the master and the talents. You know this one? And there's this uh, one servant who gets one talent. And why does he go and bury that talent? Does anybody know? He says, I knew you were a hard dude, so rather than lose it, I buried it. That's almost as, do you know that parable? Um, here's what he says in verse 24. He who also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you can have what is yours. Why did he bury his talent? Because he thought that his master was a hard man. It's actually pretty important to your growth that you believe that God is genuinely happy and genuinely pleased and generous and that it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Another reason why it's important that you, you believe that God is happy is this. Are you ready? Because everything you do, you do to be happy. Right? You may not immediately say, like, no, Drew, I hate carrots and I eat carrots. Why do you eat carrots? Because they're healthy and they help my eyesight. Not really, but we believe that, right? So even then, you do something that immediately doesn't bring you pleasure because long term, you want to be what? Healthy and happy. Everything you do, you do to be happy. So why is it important that you believe God is happy? Well, if everything you do, you do to be happy, why not come and learn from him who is always happy? Right? If everything you do, you do to be, I mean, what did Blaise Pascal said? He said, happiness is the end of everything we do, even, and every choice we make, even of those who kill themselves. Because somebody who takes their own life, what are they trying to do? At least in the pain. Every choice we make, we make in the direction of happiness. It's undeniable. We may not pretend we're more holy than that. Everything we do to be happy, that's what we do. And so why not come and learn from him who's truly happy? And so let's read Piper again. Piper says, can you imagine what it would be like if the God who ruled the universe were not happy? What if God were given to grumbling and pouting and depression like some jack in the beanstalk giant in the sky? What if God were frustrated and despondent and gloomy and dismal and discontented, dejected, we couldn't really join David in saying, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. If everything that we 
do we do to be happy than be happy in him who is truly happy. After all, Jesus said this, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Let's pray. Father, help us not to relate to you according to a lie. Help us to relate to you according to the truth that you are indeed happy and that it is your pleasure to give us the kingdom. Thank you that in that cause you sacrificed your own son in order that you may invite us into the happy land of the Trinity. Father, let us not hold out for any reason. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Or you got uh, you got like 15 minutes where you need to go get your kids. So enjoy yourselves, chat, fan yourselves. Yes, sir. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. You're exactly right. And that's what that word propitiation means. Wrath has been satisfied. On, only joy at us now. Thank you. Bless y'all. Be in prayer for Ron and Sue. They got involved in a hit and run today. They're fine. Uh, but her car is messed her brand new car is messed up uh and it's just been a rough afternoon for them so be in prayer for them uh, tonight nobody's hurt just kind of annoying right yep ron and sue